Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I want to just talk a little bit about toilet training. And I think uh, the most important thing about toilet training is that it's a journey. And it's one of many journeys that you will take with your child as they move from infant to toddler to preschool uh, to adolescence. And it's one to be enjoyed. And the one thing about journeys is that every journey is different. And there's no correct way to progress through that journey. And that's the most important thing to think about when we're talking about toilet training, that you need to actually think about what suits you and what suits your child. Now, I have three children and I trained each child a little bit differently to the other. That's the key. The other aspect is there's no correct age to start toilet training. We know that children start to show signs of readiness any time between 18 months and three years. But the key to successful toilet training is really about knowing your child. I think the tricky thing is that we're living in a very hurried existence. And there's a lot of pressure for us as parents to ensure that our children actually reach, reach their milestones, not on time, but before everybody else. And I know, I, as a parent, when I embarked on my first toilet training journey 15 years ago, that I felt the pressure to train really early. But the fact is, if you start to train a child who is not willing or able, it can be a very challenging journey for you. So it's really about preparation and readiness when we're determining when to start. So to start or not to start? That's our key question and that's one of the things that we're often asked. And toilet training really heralds an exciting and a new time for your child because it's really showing that they're starting to develop key independent skills. So in terms of thinking about successful toilet training, there are two aspects that really influence that journey for us. And the first of that is preparation and the other is readiness. When we're talking about readiness for children, we find that they start to show real signs of readiness between about 18 months and three years of age. But that can vary significantly. So the average age at which a child actually achieves toilet training or achieves daytime continence is around 28.7 months. Now we find that slightly later for boys and a little bit earlier for girls. And there's a couple of reasons why we see that gender difference, is that boys tend to be slightly delayed in terms of their language development before girls. So we find that girls tend to talk a little bit earlier and they're also receptive languages better. So they understand things like, go and get your teddy and bring it to me. And we know that language is a key to success when it comes to toilet training. So that's one aspect. The flip side is that boys tend to be more advanced in terms of their motor skills than girls. So they're more physically active. Now toilet training takes patience and time. So you need to sit on that potty for at least five minutes, giving the chance for the wheeze or poos to come. Now a very active boy doesn't want to do that. So that makes it a little bit more challenging. And that's why we see those gender differences. But I will say these are averages, okay? And there tends to be more variation within gender than across genders. So if we look at signs of readiness, and I often say to parents that we really need to divide these into three aspects. So we're talking about physical readiness, mental readiness, and also emotional readiness. So physical readiness is a, like that ability to actually feel that sensation that I need to go, and that I can also control that urge to go for a period of time. So that's the idea. Some of you might have children who have that special place that they go to for their poos in the house. And that's an indication that they actually understand that urge that they need to go. We also want children to have regular bowel movements, so that will help you understand when that's going to happen. And you want a nappy that's dry for at least two or three hours before you start doing that. We also want them to have the physical skills, so the gross motor skills that they can actually get themselves to the potty or the toilet in time. But they also need the fine motor skills, the dexterity to be able to pull their pants up and down. So that's the physical side. When we're talking about the mental side, that's the language aspect. So they need to be able to communicate to you that they need to go or that they've gone. And they also need to be able to follow what we call one step commands. So go and get your teddy and bring it to me. They also need to understand the difference between wet and dry and poo and wee. So they're the mental side. The emotional side is wanting to go. So a desire that I don't like having my nappy on anymore and I feel very uncomfortable having a wet nappy. I'm also showing my independence. So that idea where children keep saying, no, I can do it. 
And that can be challenging as a parent, but it's a really exciting sign that shows you that they are ready for toilet training. And also a, an increase in imitation. So they actually want to watch you go to the toilet. So if your child is showing two or three of each of these signs across the spectrum, then they're ready. They're ready to start thinking about toilet training. Now, how do I get started? Once they show those signs of readiness, it doesn't mean that you ditch the nappy straight away. Successful toilet training is about preparation, and that's parental preparation as well as preparation for your child. Many of you will have that friend who says, oh, my child trained in two days. And you know what? Some of them do, but I bet if you ask that parent, they prepared that child for six to eight weeks before they actually ditched the nappies. So when we're talking about preparation, it's about thinking about um, the products. So it's thinking, reading, reading and reading some more. So gather lots of information. Do a lot of research about the different processes and what, how you're going to do and how you're going to approach the toilet training process. Also find the hurdles and the challenges that you may encounter along that trip. You also need to decide what approach you're going to use. So are you going to use rewards? What are you going to do when your child goes out? How are you going to deal with accidents. You also need to think about are you going to use a potty or a toilet seat? So some parents like to go straight to a toilet seat because they don't want to then get them used to the potty and then have to transfer. If you're going to go to a toilet seat, make sure you use a step because that's going to make it a little bit easier. And think about that process there. Potties can also be quite easy because sometimes you can have a few of them. You can have them scattered around the house. You can take them with you when you go to grandparents' or aunts' places. So think about what you're going to do in terms of that process. Are you going to use pull-up training pants or are you going to use undies? Or are you going to use a mixture of both? The important thing is if you're using nappy pants or anything at the moment, you need to ditch those nappies the minute that you decide to do toilet training because the benefit of the pull-ups training pants is they have what we call a wetness liner. And what that does is that it lets the child feel wet. And that's really important because they need to associate that feeling of needing to go with actually going. So it's like a little bit of a feedback loop. And that's why you want either undies or pull-ups because it really gives you that that, that sensation and response. You also need to prepare your environment. And that means thinking, during those early days, you're probably going to have more misses than hits. So roll up that expensive antique carpet or get anything that's going to kind of stress you out if it gets destroyed. You don't need to spend a lot of money, but you probably want some wipes and you want some disinfectant as well in terms of supporting that. Because the idea is, Toilet training is a journey and journeys are meant to be fun. So you want to get rid of anything that's really going to impact on your stress levels around that. You also want to communicate with childcare. I've been um, at the Huggy stand all morning and one of the common questions that I'm asking is, they seem to be really good at home, but they're not doing very well in childcare. And that's because there's lots of competing things that are happening in the childcare environment. So speak to your child's educators. They might have lots of tips as well, but you want consistency across the different contexts that your child's in. So you don't want to be having uh, nappies off at home and then putting them, putting them in nappies again when they go to childcare. You want the same approach happening regardless of where your child is. And most importantly, it's about having fun and engaging support. And remember, all of those little stories that you're going to have will be great ammunition for their 21st. I know with my own child, we uh, did this little process where we used to actually empty his potty. He did a wee in the potty and I'd empty it into the, um, to the bath that was right next to it and would rinse it out together. And, and he was becoming much more independent and he was helping me do that. And then one day he decided to do it for me. And then I went in afterwards and he actually hadn't done a wee. He'd done a poo. And, it was, and the bath was full of that. So, but you know what? That's a really good story that I get to use afterwards. In terms of preparing your child, it's very important that you involve them in the process. And this is around buying that potty maybe six to eight weeks beforehand. And potties are a little bit like clothes. What suits someone doesn't necessarily suit someone else. So take them with you and let them pick. I had three children and I tried to recycle my potties and I can tell you each one of my children wanted a new one. And my youngest one picked a musical one that used to play a song every time he weed. And I can tell you that was not my choice of product. Let them play with it. Young children learn best through play and exploration. So let them put their dolls on the potty. Let them sit on it and watch TV before they actually start their training process. And lots of practice. So practicing putting your arm pants up and down. The time between actually feeling they need to go and actually going is very short in those early days. So they need to have things on that are really easy in terms of access to the toilet. 
read lots of books and get in conversation. There's great books, Everyone Poops, Who's Poo, That's Not My Potty. Read all those books beforehand so it demystifies the whole process for them. And let your child see you using the toilet. Modelling is the best way to teach a child. Modelling paired with communication. And that's regardless of whether you're teaching them to toilet train, read or other behaviours. It's really important to go through that process with them. And also, talk to them about signs to look out for. You know, everyone knows the wee dance where children transfer their weight from one foot to the other or where they crouch in a corner and say, that's what you do just before you need to go to wee so they can make those associations as well. Once you've gone through that preparation, then it's time to ditch the nappies. It's time to start. And if you're prepared effectively, yes, it can happen in three days. If your child is ready and effectively prepared. And enjoy the journey, because that's the time to get on that aeroplane and embark on that final leg of the journey. And remembering, when we're thinking about rewards and reinforcing children, you need to be flexible. So initially, you may just to reinforce your child for going and sitting on the potty and not even doing anything. And then you actually change those reward systems increasingly. When it comes to the use of rewards, I say you really need to understand your child's currency. And what I mean by that is some children just respond beautifully to praise. Others prefer things like my eldest loved a sticker chart. So she liked a sticker chart that we put on our fridge and she could see a visual reminder of what's happening. It's also important to get children to reflect on their own skill development so they don't actually interpret their behaviour through others' eyes that they actually can reflect themselves and be proud of their own achievements. But most important, be flexible with these rewards and reward the behaviour that you're trying to reinforce. So when it comes to children, if you're going to use rewards, they need to be immediate and you need to pair it with communication. You did a really good job getting to the potty in time. Let's go and put a sticker on your chart. Okay, so you've mastered daytime training and we're moving to the night time. So what does that mean for us? How can I train a child to be dry at night? And I guess the thing is the distance or the time between achieving daytime continence and nighttime continence can be quite variable. So it can be a couple of weeks or it can be months or years in terms of that control. The tricky thing is you actually can't train a child to be night in, in the same way as you can train a child during the day. The difference is, is daytime training, they are conscious and they are in control. At night time, they're unconscious and it's non-controlled. They don't have control over their wedding. They're asleep. So the use of rewards and punishments don't work the same way at night. It's a little bit like, does anyone snore here or is willing to share that they snore? Yeah, we've got a few little hands. So it's a bit like me saying to you, I'm going to give you a million dollars if you don't snore tonight. How are you going to get that million dollars? I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to stay awake all night because that's the only way I can guarantee that I'm not going to snore. And that's the same with bedwetting, okay? They're asleep. So what rewards and punishment do for those children, it just makes them feel bad about themselves because they can't achieve that goal. What we know is that bedwetting is developmentally normal up to around seven years of age. So it's very, very common. So if we look at a classroom of five-year-olds, I'm telling you there's probably about five or six children who are wetting their bed on a regular basis, and that's once a week or more. And this decreases to around 10% when they're seven, 5% at 10 years of age, and around 3% continue to wet when they're around 12 or 13 years of age. It, it is a very common thing, and the one thing to be uh, very clear about, that it's got nothing to do with you or your parenting. And I think the tricky thing around bedwetting is that there's a lot of myths, and many parents hide it like it's a nasty little secret, and it's somehow a reflection on them. And I can tell you, for those parents whose children don't wet the bed anymore, they've just kind of got lucky in terms of that process. So we know that punishments and rewards don't work and children do not wet the bed out of laziness. I've been working with uh, dry nights and huggies now for about 10 years around bedwetting and I really have not met a child yet who wets the bed on purpose. It's something that happens when they're asleep. Stopping fluids, it's a very common thing. If you're wetting, the idea is you want to reduce the amount of pressure on the bladder, so you're going to stop fluids. What we find is that if you restrict fluids, it actually can lead to constipation and that actually can increase the risk of wetting. So the practice is to certainly reduce things like sugary drinks because that can increase um, urine production, but encourage your child to drink regularly throughout the day in terms of water. Oh, sorry. Um, 
the other cause is the idea is that bedwetting is caused by stress. It's got something to do with I didn't do a really good job when, we were, um, when they were toilet training or there are other issues. We know that primary bedwetting, that is where children have always wet the bed, is not caused by stress. Secondary bedwetting, certainly. So children who have been dry and then return to bedwetting, that can be caused by stress. But a child who's never been dry at night, stress is not a causing factor. So if it's not, what does cause a child to wet the bed? And there seems to be a number of key factors. And the first is genetics. So there's about a 15% chance that a child will wet the bed at night and continue to do so. That increases to 40% if one parent wet the bed when they were a child, and it increases to a 75% chance if both your mother and father wet the bed as a child. The most common thing is a neurological delay, and that is a little bit like we walk and talk at different ages. Children learn and develop nighttime continence at different ages. So the children who continue to wet at night, they have what we call just a slow nervous system. So the idea is that your bladder sends a message to your brain at night saying, I am full, please wake up, I need to empty. And for the children who still wet at night, that message is just not quite getting through to their brain telling them to wake up. So what happens is they will continue wetting until that message starts to get through or they learn to actually store the amount of urine that um, their, their bladder is holding. The other is some children wet and who wet a lot do so because they have low levels of what we call an antidiuretic hormone. So what that does is the hormone is released at night and we have increases in that hormone at night. And what that does is it reduces the amount of urine our kidneys produce. If we have low levels of hormone, our kidneys produce the same amount of urine at night as we do during the day. So that is why actually children wet. And the final cause is a very small bladder capacity, and that's about less than 10% of children. And generally, we find those children tend to go to the toilet a lot during the day as well. So when do I introduce treatment? And there seems to be a bit of debate about that where some doctors say it's actually developmentally normal up to eight years, particularly for boys. So boys are twice as likely as girls to wet the bed at night. I typically say that it really depends on you. So if it bothers you or it bothers your child, then it's certainly time to follow that up with a doctor or if you have any concerns. If your child's visibly, visibly upset, if it's impacting so they don't want to attend sleepovers and other factors like that, you really need to follow up that way. When we look at the long-term impact of bedwetting, we find that there's really not a physical long-term impact. The biggest impact that bedwetting can have on children is psychological or emotional. So what you need to do is reduce the impact of bedwetting while they're wetting the bed. One of the best ways to do that is through absorbent pants like dry nights because what it means is I'm a mother, I have three children and I work full time and the idea of having to change my child's sheets every single morning is quite a challenge for me. I can't keep up with the washing as it is, let alone additional washing. So what it does is it means that I'm not feeling frustrated with my children when they're wedding and they're also sleeping soundly and feel good about themselves. So the goal about management is really about reducing that impact and the one thing we know and there's a lot of debate about um, absorbent pants, the idea that it will prolong the bedwetting process but we know that dry nights do not prolong nor do they shorten it. They're a form of management and the goal is actually to reduce the negative impact that bedwetting can have on children and parents. And I'd like to leave it there and thank you all very much. And if anyone would like to talk to me later, I'm at the Huggies stand until five o'clock tonight.